During the final days of the reign of Nero, a Roman legate, Gaius Julius Vindex, led a revolt against the Roman Emperor, which took off in March of the year 68. The next month, Vindex backed Galba, the governor of Hispania Terraconensis, as emperor, and Galba began to gather support for his claim. On the 9th of June, Nero was declared a public enemy of Rome, and this declaration, and the fact that he was unable to muster support against Galba, led the emperor to take his own life. When Galba marched on Rome, he massacred unarmed soldiers and ordered the assassination of rebels in Africa. Right from the start of his reign, then, Galba had blood on his hands, and he was not necessarily loved. His seizure of power would set off a struggle which has come to be known as the Year of the Four Emperors. When first Galba, then Otho, then Vitellius, and finally Vespasian all claimed the emperorship, and the year 69 saw the Roman Empire break into a four-pronged civil war. Galba's reign ended in assassination, but in his final moments he was defended by one man, a centurion of the Praetorian Guard named Sempronius Densus. An unremarkable man in all other respects, what little we know of him comes only from a few passages in the writings of Tacitus, Plutarch, and Dio Cassius. Also, the second man who would fight for power in the chaos after Nero's death was the governor of Lusitania and was among the first to support Galba's claim, and there were some in Galba's inner circle who secretly supported him as the correct choice. However, with his power never entirely secure and with the army stationed along the Rhine calling for a new emperor, Galba declared Piso Licinianus as his heir. He was a nobleman who traced his ancestry through his mother Scribonia back to Pompey the Great, one of the titanic forces active at the end of the Roman Republic, and the rival of Julius Caesar. So for many who mattered, this was an appropriate choice. But it's not clear if Galba knew him beforehand, or if he was a stranger to the new emperor. In any case, when Piso was declared heir on January 10th of 69 in front of the Praetorian Guard, the sky was overcast and it was raining heavily. To superstitious Romans, this was not a good omen. And while the Praetorian officers cheered, the rest did not. Nor did Galba pay them any sort of bonus. Tacitus records simply that he invoked the memory of Augustus. The Senate was also quick to support him, and they worked with the emperor to institute a new policy. Nero had spent over 2.2 million sesterces and the state required money. So it was declared that any and all who had money spent on them by Nero had to repay one-tenth of that money, and this included several officers of the Praetorian Guard. Galba's popularity was fading fast among the soldiers and the citizens, and in this context, Otho began to move. He had been integrating himself with the Praetorians for some time, learning their names, inquiring after their health, buying meals for them, and in one instance settling a massive debt for one soldier with his own private money. Five days later, on January 15th, Galba offered a sacrifice at the Temple of Apollo, and the entrails were declared an ill omen. Hearing of this, and having been told by an astrologer that his own fate was written in the stars, Otho struck. When news reached Galba and Piso that Otho was being carried to the Praetorian barracks, they were unsure of what was happening and retreated to the palace, where they tested the waters by holding a speech in front of some guards, but the men were largely unmoved. The only contingent which stayed loyal to Galba was a detachment from Germany which had taken casualties in Egypt and been nursed back to health by him, but during the course of the coup, even they eventually turned on the emperor. By late morning, amid rumors that Otho was dead, a riot had broken out in Rome, and Galba and Piso apparently entered the crowd in an attempt to calm them. Otho, however, was not dead, and he bound the Praetorians to him in a conspiracy, telling them that unless Galba was killed, they could all very well be killed themselves for treason. So they moved into the crowd, and when Galba's bodyguards saw the approaching soldiers, they abandoned him. All except Sempronius Densus. Our sources then differ slightly in the telling. Suetonius' work, The Twelve Caesars, omits him completely, but he... Suetonius' work, The Twelve Caesars, omits him completely, but has Galba speak some of the most famous words in Roman history as he breathes his last. What are you doing, soldiers? I am yours, and you are mine. Dio Cassius recounts that he defended Galba as long as he possibly could, but when Sempronius was finally overcome, the centurion was killed while still protecting the emperor's corpse. Plutarch and Tacitus, on the other hand, give a bit more detail. Tacitus records Sempronius as calling out to the still advancing Praetorians, labeling them traitors, and then stepping in front of Piso, enabling Galba's heir to escape 
and covered his retreat armed only with a dagger. Piso took refuge in the Temple of the Vestal Virgins, but eventually he was dragged out and executed on the front steps. Plutarch's account, though, gives a slightly different picture than this. No one opposed them or tried to defend the Emperor, except one man, and he was the only one among all the thousands there on whom the sun looked down, who was worthy of the Roman Empire. This was Sempronius Densus, a centurion, and though he had received no special favors from Galba, yet in defense of honor and the law took his stand in front of the litter, and first, lifting up the switch with which centurions punished soldiers deserving of stripes, he cried out to the assailants and ordered them to spare the emperor. Then, as they came to close quarters with him, he drew his sword and fought them off for a long time until he fell with a wound in the groin. When Sempronius Dentus lay dead, Galba fell to his knees and offered up his neck to the mutinous troops, instructing them to do your work, if this is better for the Roman people. And so Galba died, either being struck in the neck or being pierced multiple times and bleeding out in the streets, depending on the source being read. As for Sempronius, the dead centurion, loyal even to the last moment, entered Roman history as the epitome of valor on that black day. And Dio Cassius wrote that this is why I have recorded his name, for he is most worthy of being mentioned.